Deep Blue reusable rocket gets high and destroyed on landing. Starship IFT-5 gets ready for flight. ULA gets closer to his second certification flight. Two cosmonauts break a new space record. SpaceX retrieved portion of his IFT-4 booster after landing on water. SpaceX tells Congress that FAA is lying. ISA Aerospace and Blue Origin started their rocket hot fire tests. A large amount of rocket launches occurred across four countries. I'm Christophe Paget from All About Space and this is your Space Update. Private Chinese startup company Deep Blue Aerospace has been testing various parts of its reusable rocket named Nebula 1, a launch vehicle capable of sending two metric tons payload on low Earth orbit using traditional kerosene and liquid oxygen fuel. Back in May 2024, Deep Blue carried out a one kilometer vertical takeoff, vertical landing with a smaller rocket version using one. 50 kN thrust Thunder 5 engine, which went well from start to finish. On September 22nd, Deep Blue tested a much bigger rocket, the Nebula 1M, using three Thunder R1 engines and measured 21 meter tall and 3.35 meter wide. It took off for an altitude test between 5 to 10 km using the three engines and came down nominally on a single engine. However, the rocket crashed upon landing, not due to high speed, but the engine cut off whilst the rocket was hovering a few meters above the ground, creating an explosion, of course, and breaking the rocket in few pieces. However, Deep Blue has completed 10 out of 11 objectives, verifying their design. The full-scale rocket will use nine of his 200 kN thrust Thunder 20 engines and is expected to make his first flight next year. I would like to recognize the full transparency of our Chinese colleagues on this incident. It is not so often we get to see incidents of this kind advertised, so thank you Deep Blue. At Starbase now, the launch site has ramped up its activities with the arrival of Booster 12 and Starship number 30 and they are stacking up on the launch mount. SpaceX has started some launch system checks, such as Starship Quick Disconnect System or the Fire Protection System and many more. Now, they have also tested the booster catch mechanism, where you could see the booster 12 at its catching height. Then SpaceX wasted no time in filling the tanks on both vehicles, testing not only the fuel farm system, but also looking for leaks and anomalies in preparation for a full wet dress rehearsal. As for the Mechazilla Tower number no. 2, SpaceX is continuing to connect the pipe maze together and preparing for a flame trench and launch mount. At the production site, SpaceX rolled out the Starship number no. 34 nose cone, the one to be used on IFT number no. 8, and completed the stack up with this payload dispenser section as you could see on your screen. For information, this Starship is the second article in the version 2 configuration. Nearby, we can also see some new structures being built behind the bridge between the office building and the Star Factory. Uh, the office building facade is also complete. The ULA published a picture on X.com of his Vulcan Centaur for his second certification flight. Uh, the flight is expected on October 4th, 2024. The rocket stages have been stacked up, including the payload and his fairings. After Dream Chaser from Sierra Space was delayed and therefore could not be launched by this second certification flight, Tori Bruno, the ULA CEO, mentioned that they plan to use the dummy payload they have prepared for the first flight. But it seems that they changed their mind. Indeed, the payload comprises of experiments, detailed test objectives, demonstrations, and a whole lot of learning for the ULA team. I will cover the second flight, of course, so stay tuned for it. And if you are not yet subscribed, please do so. 
you will be pleased to know that two Roscosmos cosmonauts, Oleg Kononenko and Nikolai Chubb, as well as the NASA astronaut Tracy Dyson, have safely undocked from the ISS and landed in Kazakhstan. You may remember, perhaps, in one of my episodes, that Soyuz MS-25 had a Belarusian tourist on board and was used to swap the NASA astronaut with MS-24. To cut the story short, the two cosmonauts had to stay another six months, meaning that they have stayed at the ISS for a record single stay of over 374 days a record beaten by just over three days, obviously held by cosmonaut Sergei Prokopiev, Dmitry Petelin, and even NASA astronaut Frank Rubio back in September 2023. It might be great to be in space, but to spend over a year in a confined space is a bit much for me. A few months ago, SpaceX took the biggest and most powerful rocket to space, this was the integrated flight test number four. If you have missed it, don't worry, I left a link in the description. The booster did an accurate landing in the Gulf of Mexico, at least an accurate enough landing to grant SpaceX the audacity of trying the difficult task of catching a super heavy booster in midair by his Mechazilla tower arms. Anyway, after the relevant agencies have assessed the sea where the booster has landed, SpaceX was allowed to fish it out from the seabed. This is indeed the picture of what is left of the aft section. If you look at the footage of the booster landing, you could see a smooth landing, but something happened between the landing on water and having the booster leaning on the water surface. Now, this might just be a red herring, as the plan, of course, is to catch the booster with the Mechazilla tower arms instead. But nevertheless, these pieces will not pollute the sea further to start with and will provide important clues on what might have happened after landing on water. Staying with SpaceX, last week I announced that SpaceX was at war with the FAA and this week was no different. The FAA Administrator Mike Whitaker has been asked in the US Congress a few questions about the reasons why the FAA is delaying SpaceX license of his Starship IFT No. 5. The answer provided by Mike was strongly corrected by SpaceX in this memo, where SpaceX went on saying that Mike's statements provided to Congress were all incorrect and therefore offered a correction to Congressman Kevin Killett. Elon Musk, being Elon Musk, has even said in a tweet on x.com that Mike Whitaker needs to resign. I'm not sure if this will make the matter worse or better. If Elon attacks is a stroke of genius strategy or dumb. And we will see in the coming weeks the impact from SpaceX and Elon Musk's attacks. And the saga continues with the congressman now demanding Mike Whitaker clarification saying, I quote, calling into doubt is fitness to lead the FAA. ESA Aerospace has been developing since 2018 its two-stage rocket called Spectrum, designed to put one metric ton on low Earth orbit. It has exclusivity of the only launch pad at Andoya Spaceport in Norway. It has confirmed the start of hot fire testing campaign of its Spectrum rockets first and second stages the hardware to be used for the maiden flight, according to the European Space Flight News Channel. ESA Aerospace said that all components of our launch vehicle Spectrum have arrived in Andoya and the final preparations for the first test flight of Spectrum are in full swing. And we are currently performing hot fire tests of the first and second stages. Now, these tests will determine whether the systems meet all the necessary requirements for the first test flight. At the World Space Business Week panel, Space News magazine reported that ESA CEO Stella Guillen was targeting for sure this year for the inaugural flight of Spectrum. Now, the ESA spokesman also mentioned that depending on the results of these tests and when we will receive the NCAA license, we will carry out the first test flight as soon as possible. I cannot wait to report on this new player from Germany. 
We have seen many things of Blue Origin, such as its factory, some hardware, a sea landing platform, but we have not yet seen New Glenn in action. And this time, it happened. Blue Origin has carried out the hot fire test of his second stage of his New Glenn on his launch pad in Florida. Now, there are a few more milestones to be completed by Blue Origin, such as hot fire tests of his first stage, stage stacking, payload and fairing installation, and finally wet dress rehearsal. All that prior to a maiden flight, which was advertised to be in October 2024. So obviously, more to come and more to report on this channel. I will shortly release a video about all the European rocket companies, but in the meantime, one of them, a French startup company called Hyperspace, has released a video of his latest engine tests amongst the most complex parts of the rocket to develop. Indeed, Hyperspace is developing his Packet 1 rocket, nothing unusual of the name in France, of course, expected to be 16 meter high and capable of sending up to 250 kilogram payloads to low Earth orbit. The rocket is fueled by hybrid propellant, a mixture between solid hydroxyl terminated polybutadine or HTPB and liquid fuel. Hyperspace has concluded his engine tests at DGA in France, allowing now the team to concentrate on the rest of the rocket. So well done Hyperspace for this major milestone. September 20th, CASC launched a Long March 2D for his Jilling 1 mission wideband O2B01-06 through 06 from China. Shortly after, X-Space launched a Kaizu 1A for his mission Tianggi 29-32 through 32 from China as well. The last launch of the day was by SpaceX and a Starlink mission group 917 from California. The first stage flew for his 13th time and landed on a drone ship. September 21st, Rocket Lab launched an electron rocket from New Zealand for his mission Kinase 610 or Kinase killed the radioed star. September 24th, China Rocket, a commercial spin-off from CLT, launched a Smart Dragon 3 rocket from his sea launch platform in the South China Sea for his mission Sky Eye. On September 25th, CAS launched a Kinetica 1 from China for its Jilin 1 mission as well, but this one called SAR 01A. On the same day, SpaceX launched another Starlink mission, Group 98 from California. The first stage flew for the 10th time and landed on a drone ship. The last launch of the week was for MHI with his H2A rocket from Japan for his mission IGS Radar 8. In summary, from January 1st until September 26th, 2024, 180 rockets were launched successfully. Out of that, 111 were from an American company or institution, 44 from China and 4 from Japan. This week, I end this episode with another pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope of ARP-107, about 450 million light years away in the constellation Leo Minor. Now, the picture shows a pair of interacting galaxies, helping understanding the star formation between two galaxies and how they collided hundreds of millions of years ago. The bright white stars are in fact older stars, in orange and red are young stars and star forming regions. I'm Christophe Paget for All About Space. See you at the next episode of Space News.